Writing and arithmetic were developed in the religious temple and in the governmental palace, and they were used to count quantities and to record contracts and payments. As people delivered crops or animals, a record keeper or scribe had to count them and make a note of who had delivered them. This means that for the last 5,000 years, a common conversation in any office has been, who brought in those four items yesterday? Nobody wrote it down. Still today, you write words and add numbers for much the same reasons as required the invention of these tools. For example, to make grocery lists and to balance your bank account. When trying to count dozens or hundreds of animals, it is easy to lose track midway and have to start over. We do better if we instead drop a rock after counting each group of ten animals and when finished enumerating the herd, count how many rocks have been dropped. In Mesopotamia, stones such as these began to be used around 9000 BC. Different shapes of clay were used to indicate different types and numbers of animals. Soon, people began to instead draw pictures of animals and mark numerical symbols onto soft pieces of clay tablet. The figures were drawn using a sharp object that scraped lines into the soft clay. It took some time and effort to scrape out sections of clay. The first form of writing used pictographs, which are picture symbols that portray meaning. Can you think of a small picture that can represent the idea paid, 100 due, or the king is great. Forms of writing that use picture symbols can often be read by people everywhere. For example, if the word dog is represented by a picture of a dog, then everyone can read this symbol no matter which language they speak. Still today, Chinese writing uses symbols developed 2,500 years ago that are as much art as they are symbols. The spoken language has changed since then, but since many written symbols have not, people today can still read ancient Chinese documents. An early improvement in Mesopotamian writing was to press wedge-shaped marks into the clay rather than having to gouge lines onto the clay. That is, a pressing motion rather than a scraping motion made the process of writing much faster. Our oldest writing systems employed a unique symbol for each word, resulting in thousands of symbols, such as occurs on Kanzi's lexigram board. The oldest form of writing were so difficult to use that it took students many years to learn. A few centuries later, a different symbol was instead used only for each syllable. For example, one might represent the word Nielsen with Neil plus sun. Using the sound of sun in many words reduces the number of symbols needed in a system of writing. The fewest number of symbols occurred as we learned to represent each spoken sound by a single character. Less than 50 symbols are needed in these systems that appeared around 1000 BC. When archaeologists discover an ancient, previously unknown form of writing, they simply count the number of different symbols to quickly classify the type of writing system. Scholars reconstruct the evolution of writing systems in each region of the world. Each state adopts and improves the system obtained from a predecessor. Beginning with Akkadian cuneiform and the heretic or cursive version of ancient Egyptian writing, which was altered in the Sinai Peninsula, and then by the Phoenicians, Whenever we speak, we use our lips and tongue to alter puffs of air into the alternating series of consonants and vowels that comprise the words of a thought. The oldest alphabet, which is the Phoenician alphabet, has symbols for consonants but not for the vowels between the consonants. This alphabet became widely used in business throughout the Middle East and Mediterranean. Aramaic, which was spoken by Jesus, uses 22 symbols in its alphabet, which is a derivative of the Phoenician alphabet and a precursor to the Arabic and to the Hebrew alphabets. The Phoenician alphabet modified older symbols from ancient Egyptian writing and its proto-Semitic grip. For example, Alpu 
was the word for ox in ancient Egypt. The two horns are still seen in the Phoenician symbol. The ancient Greeks eventually adopted and modified the Phoenician alphabet. The Alpu symbol became Alpha, drawn with two curly ox horns. The Greeks put the alphabet into its Finnish form of consonants and vowels. The Alpha became the Latin A. Several Latin letters can be traced back to Egyptian hieroglyphs. The Egyptian hieroglyph Betu, or house, became the Greek Beta and the Latin B. The Egyptian hieroglyph Gamlu, or throw, became the Greek Gamma and the Latin G. The Egyptian hieroglyph Dag, or fish, became the Greek Delta and the Latin D. By the way, you might like to know that one ancient Greek was quoted to say that writing would mean the end of civilization because we would no longer have to memorize. There are similar histories for the writing systems of India, China, Southeastern Asia, and the Americas. We humans invented writing as a tool to solve certain problems. We then modified this invention through the next several centuries as we learn by trial and error how to make it simpler to learn and to use. Writing, as for any other part of our civilization, was not a gift from the gods but was invented by us human beings for our own use. Each generation inherits all the tools and procedures that the previous generations have produced and then makes them even better. Right now you are reading the current form of our system of writing. This connects you to the humans of the first cities, as do the roads and buildings that you use and the food that you eat. For some persons, writing seemed like magic in that it could be seen to actually represent the object that was written about, in the same way that artworks could be seen to represent the essence of the depicted object. Literate craftspersons might write the name of a deity on a plaque, which they then sold to an illiterate customer. Imagine that you could purchase such a plaque to hang in your home. You would then have the continued presence of that deity looking over your home. If your name was written on a plaque, your name would last forever. Throughout history, many kings and queens have boasted wildly about their power, feats, and accomplishments, as if they had only to be written down to be believed. Today, it is the advertisers and campaigners who think that it has only to be written down in order for it to be believed. Literacy was as highly a respected skill then as it is today. In fact, it is still used as a measure of the social progress of a nation. Many ancient kings and queens boasted that they could read and write, but the literacy rate of the general population was usually a few percent. Ancient Athens was a rare exception. During the 4th and 5th centuries BC, about half of its male citizens were able to read and write. Such a high literacy level was not again reached until the last two centuries. Tablets were sometimes signed by being marked with a so-called cylinder seal, which has a unique design embossed onto its surface. To transfer that design onto a piece of soft clay, the cylinder seal would be pressed onto the tablet and then rolled through one complete revolution, producing the signature, much as we sign a document today. Notice that it would have been the job of certain persons to make these seals, while others made the material using clay tablets. Society invented the rules that required these signatures and the occupations needed for their creation and use. To learn to write, scribes began school at the age of four, five, or six. Most often, they were children of the highest officials, such as governors, temple administrators, army officers, tax officials, and priests. Some young children were sent to live with foreigners to become bilingual scribes. Students memorized ancient literacy work by reciting them aloud in outdoor classrooms that everyone in town could hear as they walked past. Scribes felt that they had the best jobs in the city because the scribe had the opportunity to advance through the hierarchy. 
The scribe of a food storage facility could become chief scribe and then progress through junior judge, town ruler, district ruler, and then regional ruler. The city has a stratified and complex society, unlike that of any gather hunter group, and not very different from our own today. Scribes learned arithmetic and geometry. They would calculate the amount of stone to be cut, the amount of earth to be removed, and the labor needed for a public works project. They handled business contracts, court decisions, and the written communications between royals and officials, along with hymns to the gods, prayers and laments, and spells and rituals. We see that the administrators of the city were collecting, counting, and redistributing a variety of items and paying salaries in food and in material goods. Babylonian arithmetic used base 60. We continue using this today in our divisions of time and angles. Numbers in arithmetic seem like magic to some ancient persons and to some people today. For example, some people feel that the number 7 is lucky, but 13 is not. How about 7 times 13? Would that result be lucky or unlucky? We humans naturally count only in terms of one, two, three, and many. And research shows that some other animals do the same. Before the surplus of the farming villages, we had no reason to count much higher than the number of persons in our band. We then invented arithmetic so that we could count sheep, baskets of grain, and buckets of earth and such. This arithmetic built ancient cities and their buildings. Some people wondered what sort of things could be done with their new numbers and tried to find new ways of combining them into fractions, for example. We continue to this day to expand the fields of mathematics. As our civilization has become more complex, we require increasingly complex mathematics. We use calculus, differential equations, and computer techniques and such to build our modern civilization. 